Established in 2017, OctoMiner is an international mining hardware company. They manufacture and engineer the best mining equipment in the industry and supply rigs to some of the largest mining farms around the world. Their GPU mining rigs also integrate with the top crypto operating systems like HiveOS, MinerStat, and Simple Mining. All parts come with an international one-year warranty. Exciting news! They will be adding ASIC miners for sale to their website soon and launching a new product built specifically for ASIC home miners. Please visit octominer.com or email support at octominer.com for questions. What's up, sons? It's Blindrod with Sunda Tech once again. And today I'm excited to bring to you all the hash rates for the Ryzen 9 7950X. And yes, this CPU is quite out of reach for a lot of people in general for mining, not just due to the price of the CPU, which could be understandable if the ROI was good for just the CPU alone, but also because it's going to require an upgrade to X670, uh, basically because we've gone to essentially the same design on the CPU and motherboard as Intel with pins being on the motherboard uh, as opposed to the CPU. So that's part of the reason why, as well as like some specification changes, obviously. But not only are you going to have to upgrade that, but you're also going to have to go to now DDR5 on the memory. And this gets even more complicated because DDR5, just any old DDR5, isn't necessarily going to be the best for the system because there is something called the AMD Expo verification for these new chipsets and CPUs and it's spelled EXPO and that will basically allow you to apply the memory overclocks essentially if you're going to have like it's basically the same as an XMP profile on Intel or previously on AMD DOCP. Now it will read the DOCP profile or an XMP profile from other DDR5 memory but your initial boot up times could take minutes and we're talking like 20 minutes stuff like that a lot of people are having a lot of issues with it you can go search and scour the internet for that with the particular memory setup and motherboard setup and cpu setup that i had we actually booted fairly quickly if not way faster than expected especially because we did it live over on twitch.tv slash blind run and it's pretty funny i had to run over there because it had already booted into windows because i had a pre-installed version of windows on the nvme and uh, because we were just wanting to get into testing as quickly as possible and bing bang boom it was already loaded in so i had to actually manually reboot go into the bios and then set the actual memory profile uh, to of course the expo settings there is also an option within there to select the uh, the actual DOCP settings which was a 4800 megahertz overclock as opposed to the 6000 megahertz overclock but let's go ahead and get into all of the specifications here how we have the test bench configured and why that is extremely relevant for this particular testing so First things first, obviously, let's talk about the CPU that we chose. It is going to be the AMD Ryzen 9 7950X. This is going to be a 16 core, 32 thread CPU with a base clock of 4.5 gigahertz and it has a boost clock of 5.7 gigahertz. It has 16 megabytes of L2 cache, one megabyte of L1 cache, and 64 megabytes of L3 cache. Now it does have, it is unlocked for overclocking, etc. However, the undervolting options and so on are limited depending on the platform and BIOS you are currently utilizing. So we'll talk about that also later on for the mining perspective because that will, of course, affect this in particular with the testing that we had to do. So moving on from there, talking about memory is kind of interesting. There is only to my understanding, dual channel supported here because if you look at the connectivity, your memory channels are two. And this is a little weird because, you know, still on Intel, you can get quad channel memory. I don't know how this will affect, of course, overall performance if you had, you know, four sticks in there. I think it may decrease that overall performance because of Ryzen's typical dependence on memory but and, and memory speeds. But 
that will have to be tested once I have the actual ability to test it. So I don't quite have that ability right now. We ran dual channel memory at the 6,000 megahertz, which we'll talk about now. A big change here with the new CPUs from AMD is that we do have graphics capabilities built in to pretty much the entire lineup, including the 7950X. And I will be testing this in mining, of course, the GPU intensive algorithms or the GPU enabled algorithms in a separate video. Today, we're focused on the, uh, of course, CPU algorithms because, you know, GPU algorithms are typically going to do better on a discrete GPU, but it will still be interesting to test those out. So stay tuned and make sure you're subscribed to the channel for that. So there you go. That's pretty much what we're, what we're talking about. Kind of funny that the key features for supported technologies is AMD Expo, which to me seems more of like a, a crutch for memory support uh, that, or even what I would consider a handicap more than a feature, right? So if you have to have a memory specification, brand new one built for your CPU alone and blah, 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 then, you know, it seems like a little bit of a handicap. Of course, this handicap has been given to Intel since the very beginning because where did XMP come from? That came from Intel. So it's a little unfair to say that, you know, both sides don't have that. It's just the fact of the matter is you have to be extremely careful now when purchasing memory for AMD. Not that that has necessarily been something that wasn't a problem in the past, of course, because as you know, Ryzen has been since its inception, a little picky with its memory, right? Now, in, in my particular case, what we ended up going with was the Trident Z5, and this is basically the Neo RGB, basically kind of the, the new version of the Trident Z Neo, some of my favorite memory in existence because it works so well with Ryzen with like little to no issues back in the day with DDR4 3600 and 3200 megahertz. It was kind of like, hey, just go buy that because that's going to always work in Ryzen which is super awesome. In this particular case now, uh, this one is going to be essentially DDR5 clocked at 6,000 megahertz, two sticks of 16 gigabytes, and is a CAS latency 32. So that's gonna be 32, 38, 38, 96 at 1.35 volts. This memory can be quite expensive. If you get it from Micro Center, I got it for $250. However, the price tag for this originally was $389 for a 32 gigabyte kit. And that can be quite crazy. So make sure you check your local micro centers for better pricing. Basically, if you want to go up to like 6,400 megahertz, it's extremely pricey and I, I would recommend against it. However, I don't know how much, you know, that extra 400 megahertz may impact, of course, performance because it could. And some of the preliminary hash rates that I saw on Monero that were being reported seemed to be uh, basically kind of capped or, or gimped. It could be for one of two reasons, of course. And a part of that could be either the memory or the cooling, but I'm leaning towards cooling. But before we get into the cooling setup, let's talk about the motherboard. The motherboard that I went with in this particular case was, was the ASRock X70E Tai Chi. Now, my new favorite motherboard for Intel has been the Gigabyte Aorus Master Series, and I've gotten that for my 11900K and for the 12900K that I have here that I'm currently actually recording this video on. However, in the case of AMD, what I noticed is bumping up to the Master, which was a $500 price point, not dissimilar, actually the exact same price point as the X70 Tai Chi, did not upgrade the power phases or the power phase design or increase the amount of power phases or add better caps or anything along those lines. However, updating to the Tai Chi for the 499 price tag upgraded all of that, right? So now what we ended up with was a 24 plus two plus one power or phase power design with of course some other bad A features. You know, in my humble opinion, you got the Gen 5 M.2s, you got this crazy thing where it comes with the Gen 5 fan heat sink. If you want to utilize it, we'll be testing it on this channel later. Right now I have the basic heat sink on there without the actively cooled heat sink for the M.2 drive, which is, you know, just an interesting added uh, bonus here. But on the durability, of course, uh, the power phase design is great. And then you got the 12K black caps, 100% Japanese made, high quality conductive uh, polymer capacitors. 
and you got the killer 2.5 gigabyte LAN. So if you do have that ability, you know, you can utilize that. You also have the 802.11 AX Wi-Fi 6E module. So super fast uh, Wi-Fi as well, if that's something you want to basically participate in. And then on the memory side of things, super important here, if we're looking at this, what does it support as far as memory overclocks? And yes, it does support up to 6,600 uh, megahertz. That is, of course, well, one DPC, uh, DPC and one uh, rank. And then if you want to go to dual rank, then it, it appears that it drops down to 6,000 megahertz. And then obviously it has that 4,800 megahertz natively, which we talked about previously. So while it does support extreme uh, or XMP, technically, really you want to still be looking for that expo support on the memory modules if you're building this system from the ground up sure if you're running a 12900k and you already had some ddr5 laying around go ahead and give it a shot right there's nothing bad about giving a shot now i think if you are running 4000 to 4800 megahertz memory i don't think you're going to have many issues However, if you're running faster memory like 5200 megahertz or above, then I think that's where you really run into the need for the Expo. That's just conjecture though, because what I do have is only 4800 megahertz memory or only the 6000 megahertz memory. Both of those seem to work. Of course, the 6000 megahertz memory boots faster, that sort of thing. But that's kind of where we're at as far as all the testing that I've gotten done so far tonight, because I did drive, of course, eight hours basically to pick up the parts came back live streamed tested everything got all the b-roll and that took some time so this is essentially what we went with and then as far as the cooling you can see actually we have the test bench right back here the cooling for this particular setup i decided to go with was the noctua nhd 15 for a couple reasons right so when you look at this particular setup you're running a high-end cpu i don't expect that people are going to spend less than a hundred bucks on cooling right i think it's fair to say that in a mining situation though you would go with an air cooler and not with a basically a liquid cooler that also being said i think not all liquid coolers are you know born equal you are going to see worse performance on some, a lot of AIOs than you are on the Noctua NHD 15. However, these CPUs do run extremely hot. The interesting thing about it though, is that essentially it is set up in a manner that is going to push the CPU up to 95 degrees Celsius as much as possible. And so if you basically improve your cooling, the CPU is going to be pushed further. Now, in this particular case, what we ended up with that was very interesting was very good Cinebench scores, of course, as well as a very good CPU Z scores and pretty good hash rates as well. However, at least half of the cores were hitting essentially 5.75 gigahertz, which is above the average boost. And it was pushing the voltage way above 1.4 volts, which means we were hitting on the CPU package 97 degrees Celsius and on the CPU core 95 degrees Celsius. So that 95 degrees Celsius actually is on the CPU core, not the total CPU package. And that is running on Noctua NHD 15. So yes, the, the CPU is performing at its best performance at, uh, or above best performance than uh, as advertised usually using, using the Noctua NHD 15. And I think the mileage varies a ton depending on the cooling capabilities. And I think that's why you're going to see very, very widely different benchmarks depending on what kind of cooling setup people are utilizing, even down to the thermal paste and the motherboards, because obviously a big thing here is going to be the amount of consistent power delivery these motherboards can handle, which is why I think uh, that you might end up seeing kind of the ASRock Tai Chi motherboard have a significant advantage here with its extra power phases. Now we'll be having a, a review for the ASRock Tai Chi X670 you know, motherboard later on. So if you're interested in that, hit the subscribe button as well. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the hash rates though, because obviously this went on for a, a very long time. So I want to make sure that we got this all locked in for you, right? So 
Hopping right in, we have Crypto Night Fast at 5,400 hash a second at 230 watts. And then Random X, which is going to be your Monero at 20,000 hash a second at 300 watts. Now, Dagger Hash or Dagger X DAG is no longer a viable coin because it's dead coin and the deposits are locked on the exchange that it is currently on, which is CoinX. So you can pretty much ignore that. Monero, you're going to be losing 25 cents a day. And so not really worth it. And then if we kind of scroll down to that crypto night fast on Masari, we are looking at losing about 44 cents a day. So no profitability there. But really, if we compared that against other other basically CPUs, this is where it gets impressive, right? This particular CPU is beating out things like the Intel Xeon Gold 6248. It's even beating out its own bigger brother on the on the server side of the Intel or sorry, the AMD Epic 7451 24 core processor 48 thread. So we are seeing basically server grade performance from the narrow perspective on of course the on a desktop grade cpu and it doesn't stop there of course in cinebench we were way above the w or the wx 299 or the 2990 wx threadripper cpu with like a 37,000 score. So these things are getting really interesting and the single core is looking really good too because even in things like CPU Z with the single core, we saw 808 on the score there, which means yes, we are seeing, you know, basically single threaded and multi-threaded performance beating out Intel of course at the price of sort of basically power and heat, which is kind of what we're dealing with. Now, the hash rates don't stop there, of course. We have Minotaur X which is gonna put you at 3,144 hash a second at 315 watts. Ghost Rider, everybody's favorite CPU algorithm for Raptorium at 4,917 hash a second at 300 watts. Crypto Knight Haven at 1,835 hash a second at 300 watts. Curve Hash at 369 hash a second at 261 watts. Varus hash at 62 hash a second or 62 mega hash a second, excuse me. And we're going to have to do that conversion again for the profitability at 300 watts. We have Argon uh, 2 ID Chukwa at 41,935 hash a second at 300 watts. We have Astro BWT V3 at 12,300 hash a second at 330 watts. We have Pufferfish 2, which did recently get AMD support, but is not doing as well still on the AMD GPUs as it is doing on CPUs. And that one's very impressive on the CPU as well at uh, 4,062 hash a second at 300 watts. We have Mike algorithm, which is basically exactly like Ghost Rider, just with a few less algorithms thrown in the mix at 4,917 hash a second at 300 watts. We have YesCrypt R16 at 3,179 hash a second at 315 watts. And then we did a calculation with 10 cents a kilowatt hour for all of these coins. The final coin that I have in here is going to be the Safe X Cash. And that is basically exactly what we saw with Monero, which is going to be 20,000 hash a second at 300 watts. We also took a look at TLO, uh, which is the Crypto, uh, Crypto Night T algorithm. Essentially, this one ended up being basically five tenths of a mega hash. Um, and that was at 300 watts. And we also did look at ARC ARQ mining as well. And that was at 82,669 hash a second. And that one, uh, we calculated out essentially without, uh, the power because it didn't have a power, power calculator for me to take a, take a look at. Now, I primarily used Rabid Mining's calculator here because I found it to be the easiest to find personally as far as all of this goes. But for some of them, you know, we did compare with Minerstat as well. And if it didn't have support, then we checked some others. Now, Rabid Mining is awesome. He covers all of the CPU mining and you will definitely want to go check out his review for the 7950X as well. But using his calculator here, you know, at this point, 
Currently, we do have some interesting profitability in Dara, which is the Astro BWT V3, and that's coming in at $1.03 a day after power and $1.82 a day before power. Pretty impressive results for that. On Bamboo Coin, which is the Puffer Fish 2 Bomb algorithm, or BMB algorithm, I guess it's technically Bamboo, but I like to say Bomb. And I like to say Astro Bot instead of Astro BWT, but you know what? It is what it is. We'll call it, we'll make sure it's clear. Pufferfish 2 BMB is going to be 28 cents a day after power and a dollar a day before power. Now on the Ghost Rider algorithm, I was made aware that there are there is a new coin that is out that it's profitable on. I'm gonna be honest with you, put it down in the comment section below and I'll pin it because I know you're watching the live channel and you probably watched this, but I can't remember the name of it right now. That being said, uh, uh, J JGC coin is at 23 cents a day in revenue and 95 cents a day before power. Then on the mic algorithm, we have VKAX, VKAX, and that is going to be seven cents a day in revenue and 79 cents a day before power. Pretty much everything else is unprofitable, including Monero, which is gonna lose you 27 cents a day after power. You're gonna have ties in on the Yes Crypto R16, losing basically 50 cents a day after power. Havens losing 60 cents a day after power. Turtle coin, is losing 56 cents a day after power. Pulsar, because you got the GPUs on the network now, losing 63 cents a day after power. You got Yerb on the Ghost Rider, losing 70 cents a day after power. Avian on Minotaur X, losing 70 cents a day after power. Veris Coin losing 72 cents a day after power. And Yada Coin losing 72 cents a day after power. So that's pretty much where we wrap it up. If we look at Safe X uh, just on Minor stat, we're losing three cents a day after power. And we are also losing, or we are actually making about two cents a day after power on TLO, which is another profitable coin. And ARC was doing about 12 or 23 cents a day before power, uh, which means that at this point it is probably losing about 70 cents a day after power for if it's 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And then finally on Vera's coin, we're losing, you know, basically five hundredths of a penny not a lot but you are still losing money on Vera's coin and really it's going to come down to how well can we lock in these voltages later on down the line is that going to be something that's you know capable that these rigs are capable of doing especially in a setting like hive os and linux uh, that is kind of up in the air because you would prefer to do most of it in the bios but from my understanding most of the undervolting for most biases are not available at this time and so you'll have to basically check with your motherboard manufacturer, look for an updated BIOS to support undervolting. And that will be a key feature when we're talking about mining. The other downside with mining, of course, on this CPU is going to be the higher than, you know, ideal power consumption at really averaging around 300 watts at all times with everything on a very high idle power consumption at 81 watts when we were testing that because basically right out of the box this thing is idling pretty high at 1.3 volts 1.35 volts just which is crazy because a lot of people actually use that for like overclocking voltage previously so pretty nuts that that's just its idle voltage and then in addition to that, it's going to require a lot of cooling to actually hit the clocks that are going to give you these types of hash rates, right? We're talking about using a Noctua NHD 15, which is no slouch. And you really like, to be honest, you're not going to find much better of an air cooler out there. And for mining, you know, it's not going to make a ton of sense to do an AIO. Because if you're running these systems 24 seven and you have an AIO on there and a pump dies or gets clogged up or you have basically it's in a hotter environment and all the liquid evaporates in this AIO, you're kind of like basically gonna burn up your processor at that point. Not an ideal situation in a mining farm. I'd rather go air. And basically if you're going air, I think this is the setup you're gonna be on. You're gonna have to get the Noctua NHD 15. Um, as far as any other testing that you guys would like me to do, let me know in the comments section below. If there's something outside of mining that you would like me to take a look at, I'm definitely down to do that. I'm enjoying this platform so far, so I definitely want to play with it more. So please, you know, leave those suggestions down below. 
check the links in or the the links in the description if you're going to purchase any of this stuff uh, off of my recommendation that way i get a kickback hit the like comment subscribe and notification bell down below and i will see you next tuesday for additional content that also goes into more opinionated pieces surrounding the politics around crypto, make sure you check out sonofatech.locals.com. There you can become a member for free or even choose to support for basically additional content at $5 a month. It's helping me stay alive through the crypto winter.